Good evening. Tonight we're going to share a topic that uh, many of you may not have been familiar with. We're going to talk about risk without responsibility, the human agro experiment. How many of you have heard or studied into or know a little bit about genetic engineering? A few of you do, okay. For those of you that, that haven't uh, really studied too much into it, you will probably find this quite an eye-opener. I know when we first uh, began to uh, be made aware of genetic engineering and what was taking place with our food, it was quite a shock. And I think you'll be surprised if you are not aware at what is taking place. This is a statement from Dr. John Fagan. He says, we are living today in a very delicate time, one that is reminiscent of the birth of the nuclear era when mankind stood at the threshold of a new technology. No one knew that nuclear power would bring us to the brink of annihilation or fill our planet with highly toxic radioactive waste. We were so excited by the power of a new discovery that we leapt ahead blindly and without caution. Today, the situation with genetic engineering is perhaps even more grave because this technology acts on the very blueprint of life itself. And you are going to see how that takes place, the very blueprint of life itself. Okay, let's take a look. Walk through the aisles of any supermarket. Sit down to eat in just about any restaurant, cafeteria, or lunchroom. Open your cupboards or refrigerator. Look at what's cooking in your oven, microwave, or frying pan. Or what's on your fork, your spoon, in your cup, or your drinking glass. You can't see, smell, taste, or feel the difference. And you can't read about it on food labels or restaurant menus. But you and your family are now part of a vast culinary and biological experiment, dining on an expanding menu of genetically engineered foods, foods that are unlike any foods consumed in human history. All of us are subject to this technology. All of us are part of this experiment that is taking place. So what is genetic engineering? Let's take a look and let's see what a definition is here. Genetic engineering basically is the practice of altering or disrupting the genetic blueprints, that's the DNA of living organisms, and then patenting these altered genes and selling the resultant gene food, seed, or other products for profit. So what they're doing is taking the blueprint, the, the genetic blueprint of something, a seed or something like that, and then they are altering that blueprint, and then they're placing a patent on that, and then that is sold for profit. That is now owned by whatever biotech uh, company has done the engineering or the modification on that. So scientists are transferring an indeterminate amount of genetic information or DNA from one or more organisms across species boundaries into another host organism to create an entirely new genetically engineered organism. Okay, so what's taking place is they're taking that gene from some organism that possibly was never ever, uh, would never ever cross in nature with another organism. They're taking a gene from that, a lot of times it's across those species boundaries and inserting it into another uh, organism into the DNA, that creates a new organism, something entirely new. It's a living organism, but it's not the original of either one of those. Do you understand how that takes place? If you change something, if you change the blueprint, it is no longer the original, right? You've changed it. And the very fact that they can place a patent on it shows you that they have altered it significantly enough. It's not the original. Although if you talk to them, they will be uh, very strong in their statements that it, there is no difference. They will tell you there is no difference. And so my question has always been, then how can you place a patent on it if there is no difference? Obviously, obviously something has been altered. Now an organism is made up of cells. We are organisms. And every cell contains a nucleus which contains your chromosomes. 
Each chromosome contains an uninterrupted double-stranded braid of DNA, which, if taken from each of your 46 chromosome, chromosomes and measured end-to-end, -end, it would measure more than two meters in length. That's amazing. That's incredible when you think about it. The DNA is analogous to the string of letters that makes up the sentences of a book, and genes would be analogous to individual words. Okay, so that would kind of be what we would be looking at here. So DNA is like the string of letters to make up a sentence. And the nucleic acids, that's all those brightly colored little uh, stair steps that came down there, the nucleic acids in the chain represent the information in the gene just as the sequence of letters gives meaning to a written word. So we could compare the DNA to this sentence at the top of the screen there. That would be like the DNA. It's this long chain of information. And the gene would be like any individual word that you could pluck out of that sentence. And the nucleic acids, which are, are what are in between the stair steps of that ladder, that would just be the letters of any one of those particular words. So that's what sort of gives meaning to any particular section. So if you were to, um, I'll see if my little uh, pointer is working here tonight. If you were to pick out a section of this DNA, which would be a gene, then those little nucleic acids would give the information that is necessary to understand what that is. And what that gene will do is build a protein. That's what genes do, okay? So the reading of the DNA or that sentence of information is known as gene expression, okay? The final product of gene expression is the synthesis of molecules called proteins, which exist in a wide variety of shapes and sizes and perform many different functions. You're going to see a little video clip now, which is actually going to show an animation of what takes place when a protein is made, okay? This is from uh, the video, Unlocking the Mystery of Life. This is a great DVD. I would really recommend, if you haven't watched it, pick yourself up a copy and watch it. It's amazing. But I'm just going to show you a little clip which shows how a protein gets made. You will see the DNA unraveling. You will see a little section that's going to be red, okay, to express uh, that gene transformation or that protein that's going to, going to be made from that. So we'll just play this clip and see if... In the years since Kenyon's rejection of chemical evolution, science has revealed the details of an entire system of information processing that bears the hallmarks of intelligent design. With computer animation, we can enter the cell to view this remarkable system at work. After entering the heart of the cell, we see the tightly wound strands of DNA, storehouses for the instructions necessary to build every protein in an organism. In a process known as transcription, a molecular machine first unwinds a section of the DNA helix to expose the genetic instructions needed to assemble a specific protein molecule. Another machine then copies these instructions to form a molecule known as messenger RNA. When transcription is complete, the slender RNA strand carries the genetic information through the nuclear pore complex, the gatekeeper for traffic in and out of the cell nucleus. The messenger RNA strand is directed to a two-part molecular factory called a ribosome. After attaching itself securely, the process of translation begins.
Inside the ribosome, a molecular assembly line builds a specifically sequenced chain of amino acids. These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell and then linked into chains often hundreds of units long. Their sequential arrangement determines the type of protein manufactured. When the chain is finished, it is moved from the ribosome to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape critical to its function. After the chain is folded into a protein, it is then released and shepherded by another molecular machine to the exact location where it is needed. This is absolutely mind-boggling to perceive at this scale of size such a uh, finely tuned um, apparatus, a device that's, uh, that bears the marks of intelligent design and manufacture. And we have the details of an immensely complex molecular realm of genetic information processing. And it's exactly this new realm of molecular genetics where we see the most compelling evidence of design on the Earth. OK. So you can see how a protein is actually made in the body. And what happens then, that strand of DNA, that's what they call coding for protein. That section that unraveled, that's what they call it coded for protein, okay? Just so you understand what that terminology is. And it's fascinating too, I love sharing that uh, with people because so many people think that when you eat protein, uh, it's just sort of some chunk that uh, your body takes in and sort of sticks somewhere wherever it's needed. And they don't realize how very complicated uh, what the, the building of protein in our body is. Our body doesn't just take a chunk of something and stick it somewhere in the body that it needs. Everything is broken down. You can see all those little amino acids being stuck together to form a chain. And we'll talk more about amino acids tomorrow night. So just remember what those amino acids uh, are, that they're the building blocks for the protein. And then your body actually has to fold all that up in a certain way, and that makes a protein. Um, but that's what they call, then, that section of DNA. That's what they call coding for protein. Now, most of the structure of DNA is little understood, and because it is non-coding for protein, it is commonly regarded as junk and ignored. This includes 97% of human DNA, Nobody has a clue what will happen if these junk elements are changed. So 97% of our DNA they consider junk because it doesn't code for protein. Isn't that interesting? I don't believe it's junk. I believe that science, scientists have just not yet discovered what it's for. But God did not make junk in our bodies. Everything has a purpose. They just don't know what it's for yet. But the point is, no one knows what will happen if those uh, junk elements are changed. Now, if you had, for instance, uh, let's say we could take this room right here, and let's say they wanted to expand this room, maybe make a, a more open concept, and decided to knock out a wall here. Do you think it would be important to understand what the ramifications of taking that wall out could have on the structure, the safety of the structure? You would need to know how everything was impacting each other to know what would happen if you were to make a significant change like that. That's what we're talking about here. If you're going to change something at the blueprint level, you need to understand what effect that will have on the overall a structure on the safety of the overall structure. And that is what uh, scientists are doing. They are tr uh, actually changing at the blueprint level that structure. 
Now, genetically modified organisms are created by taking genes from organisms such as bacteria, viruses, or animals, and then inserting them into other often unrelated species. And this was actually something that was done at one time. These are not pictures of flounder up there, but they did take genes from flounder and insert them into the DNA, into the blueprint of tomatoes. Okay, that was the flavor saver tomato that uh, came out for a short period of time. Um, so that is what we're talking about. That kind of, of uh, change would never occur in nature. You don't see fish leaping out of the water to mate with tomatoes. Okay, God has placed species boundaries there, right? That doesn't ha take place. And there's a good reason for it. We may not understand all of the reasons why those, those two organisms should not be crossed, but God has a reason and, and has therefore put species boundaries in place, okay? But this is what we're talking about with genetic engineering. Species boundaries do not exist when it comes to genetic engineering. So this is unlike traditional breeding. We're not talking about traditional breeding when we talk about genetic engineering. Genetic en engineering creates new organisms that would never occur in nature, creating new and unpredictable health and environmental risks because obviously they do not know all of the ways that this is going to affect the structure of that organism. And so therefore, we don't know where this technology could possibly take us. We can't see the future of it. Now, how do scientists transfer genes into the DNA of another species? You saw on that little video clip uh, that DNA is inside the nucleus and there's a little gatekeeper there that's controlling what comes in and out of the cell nucleus. And so obviously there has to be some way to get past the gatekeeper. And scientists have different ways of doing this. But one common method used to insert genes is just to blast them into the DNA with a 22 caliber gene gun. Scientists first coat thousands of tiny shards of gold or tungsten with the foreign gene. Then they point it at a dish containing thousands of unsuspecting cells and fire, hoping that at least some of the foreign genes will end up in the right place in at least some of the DNA. And this, by the way, is what the biotech industry refers to as their highly precise method of gene transfer. I would be interested to see what maybe some of the other methods that are not that precise are. Okay, so in order to get past that little gatekeeper, they're going to have to actually have something that can get in there. And they, they actually put together a whole package when they send uh, a, a novel gene into the DNA of another organism. So they have something called a vector. You can just think of a vector as a vehicle, okay? This is the vehicle that's going to transport the package into the cell, into the DNA. And vectors are typically virus and bacteria. That's what they use. Because virus and bacteria have the capability of going inside. Uh, we know that uh, the flu virus is something that travels easily. And we can, we can get the flu virus very easily. It has a way of sort of hijacking that cell, getting inside, and then it starts replicating itself, and we get the flu. Okay, so they will use virus and bacteria because they have ways of sneaking in past the gatekeeper. They can get inside. Then they need something to turn this on because not every protein uh, or every section, the, every gene in that section of DNA is turned on to produce a protein. It's not all turned on at the same time. Different sections are turned on in different areas and at different times. So what they need is something to turn this on. It's called a genetic promoter because once you get that foreign gene in there, something has to say, okay, start making protein. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so a genetic promoter Typically, they'll use something like the cauliflower mosaic virus. This has nothing to do with cauliflower, so don't be afraid to eat your cauliflower. But it's just a virus, and that's actually a, um, a drawing of it right there. But it, it has sort of the shape of cauliflower, and that's why it's named a, a cauliflower mosaic virus. Then they have to have something that shows that that transfer actually took place. Because remember, they're pointing this gene gun at this dish of, of unsuspecting cells and firing, 
And then something has to tell them that that gene actually got inside the DNA and this has now become a genetically engineered cell or organism, okay? So a proof of transfer is something that they use called an antibiotic resistant marker gene, antibiotic resistance marker gene or the ARM gene. Basically what that is, is it's a gene that goes in that resists antibiotics. And so what they'll do is they'll, they'll then apply antibiotics after they've, uh, uh, you know, shot their um, genes at these cells, then they'll use antibiotics. The cells that died are the ones that did not get the transfer. The cells that live are the ones that did. The part that worries me is anything that's resistant to antibiotics because there may be a time and a place in your life that you may need antibiotics and you don't want something that is inside of you creating resistance to antibiotics. Now, of course, the biotech industry has said that these genetically engineered uh, gene, uh, genes and cells do not actually survive through the digestive tract. And we'll take a, lo a look a little bit later here and you'll see that that's actually not the case. That's misinformation. They do survive the passage through the digestive tract. So this is the package that's going in when they genetically modify something. You've got your vector, your vehicle, your little virus or bacteria that's going to carry this in past the gatekeeper. Then you've got your uh, promoter that's going to turn it on, typically the uh, cauliflower mosaic virus, then you have your antibiotic resistant marker gene that's just along for the ride now because that was used initially so that the scientists would know which genes had been transferred. But that, that gene is still active, is still going along for the ride. So that's kind of the package going in. I want to share with you, this actually is from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Food and Drug Administration. Uh, this is what the FDA had to say in regard to the use of antibiotic resistant marker genes in transgenic plants or genetically modified plants. I just want to share this because it's very interesting how they word things. But the FDA acknowledges that the likelihood of transfer of an antibiotic resistant marker from plants to microorganisms in the gut or in the environment is remote. So they're saying it's remote, but they're not saying it's impossible. And that such transfer, if any, would likely be insignificant when compared to transfer between microorganisms, and in most cases would not add to existing levels of resistance in bacterial populations in any meaningful way. So that's what they're saying, nothing really to worry about. But then they say, nonetheless, FDA believes that developers should evaluate the use of antibiotic resistant marker genes in crops on a case-by-case -case basis. FDA notes that certain antibiotics are the only drug available to treat certain clinical conditions. Marker genes that encode resistance to such antibiotics should not be used in transgenic plants. Very interesting. So they're saying it's, it's very remote, couldn't really happen. If any, it wouldn't have really any significant uh, effect. But then they're saying those marker genes that encode resistance shouldn't be used. So I believe that there is a health hazard that is there. The extent of it, I don't know. How great it is, I don't know. But I think there is a health hazard there that we should be concerned about uh, um, with the genetically engineered foods. Now, to understand the effect of an additional gene on an organism, it's necessary to know in detail all of the ways in which DNA can change and the purpose of all those changes in the life of the organism. And we talked about that. If, if we were to, to make a major structural change in this building, we would want to know what effect that would have on the overall safety of that structure. And it's the same with genetic engineering. If we're going to start taking a gene from one organism, adding it to another organism to create something entirely new, we should understand in detail all of the ways that that's going to change and the purpose of all of those changes. Otherwise, we could end up with something that we never thought would happen. And that is what's happening right now. Scientists actually are ending up with things that they did not expect to take place. You'll see in, in a, a moment here. Genetic engineers can cut and splice genes very precisely in a test tube, but the process of putting those genes into a living organism is extremely imprecise, inaccurate, and uncontrolled. Once a gene is inserted into an organism, it can cause unanticipated side effects. 
Mutations and side effects can cause genetically engineered foods to contain toxins and allergens and to be reduced in nutritional value. So obviously it's having an effect that they weren't anticipating uh, that it would have. Charlie Chronic of Greenpeace had this to say, after years on the market, Monsanto reveals that neither the industry or the regulators actually know what genes are in GMOs. Because once that organism leaves the scientific lab, once it's out in the field, once it's out in the water, wherever it is, once it's out the door, it's now, it's a living organism. It can cross with other organisms, it can mutate, it's out there and it's gone. This is completely different than other types of pollution. You know, we may say, wow, we, we really made a mistake with something and we can usually, you know, recall it or clean up the mess or something. This is not like that. This is something that has gone and you can't recall it. It's alive. It's a living organism. But it's not something that God created in the first place because it's something entirely new. It's been changed at the blueprint level. When you think about the fish and the tomato, the flounder and that tomato, the cross that was made because it was changed at the blueprint level, it's now no longer a fish and it's not a tomato. It may look like a tomato, but it truly is not a tomato. It's something that God did not create. So this is a technology that is creating entirely new organisms that God did not create. One of the first early genetic engineering experiments illustrates the perils of attempting to transfer genetic characteristics from one species to another. In the 1980s, U.S. Department of Agriculture scientists transplanted human genes, these are genes supposedly associated with human growth, into pigs. By doing so, they hoped to make the pigs grow faster and increase their profitability for farmers. Unfortunately, the outcome of these experiments was not what the USDA scientists expected. In one infamous incident, instead of the super pig they hoped for, the pig that resulted from this gene experiment developed into a deformed creature, one that was excessively hairy, lethargic, riddled with arthritis, apparently impotent and slightly cross-eyed. As if that weren't bad enough, the pig could barely stand up, according to reports. Now this is a gene that was supposedly all it, all it did in humans, all it does in us, is cause growth to take place. And so they just figured you remove this growth gene and stick it into the pig's DNA and it will just make the pig grow. But we're talking about something entirely different. These are two completely different organisms. And we're changing now the blueprint of that organism. Where was it inserted in the DNA? Did you know that actually where the gene is inserted does make a difference to how that operates? So where was it inserted? And uh, there could be a whole host of things that uh, affected the reasons why that, didn't, that did not actually cause growth to take place. Instead, it caused all of these mutations to take place. But you can see what, what science is actually working with here. I don't believe that this is a science that God sanctions in any way, shape, or form. It's changing what he created in the beginning. And if you will notice, what they are doing is trying to increase the profitability. You will see that a lot of times these sciences come back to that P word, that profitability. And that's what they were hoping to do, make these super pigs grow faster and increase their profitability for the farmers. Okay. These are actually some transgenic animals. They have been genetically modified. This is known as the muscle cow. Uh, it's been engineered by suppressing the production of myostatin. And myostatin is what actually controls the growth of muscles so that we wouldn't just continue to grow you know, out of control. And scientists have already inhibited myostatin gene in mice and are working on blocking the gene in humans. These are chickens here. Uh, genetically engineered, uh, they're called featherless chickens. They're engineered not to have any feathers. I suppose the reasoning is to make it easier for cleaning uh, for market. To me, this is sad when I look at this because I see uh, these poor animals which we were given to take care of. 
that are being sadly deformed. And it's because of greed and the desire for profit. And I feel, I feel so sad for these animals that this is being done to. Uh, Dr. Arpad Pusti, how many of you have heard of him? Uh, he's a Hungarian scientist, no one's heard of him. Okay, uh, he was actually studying genetically modified potatoes. Uh, he had been chosen, he, him and his research team had been chosen to do research on genetically modified uh, organisms by the biotech industry. Uh, his team was in the, at the Rowett Institute in Aberdeen, Scotland. And they began this research, this was publicly funded research, and they began this research. He was actually quite, uh, I guess, excited maybe was the word to do it because he felt maybe there was some merit to genetically engineered foods. And so they began into this research. About two years into the research, he came up with some very disturbing conclusions. And those conclusions, this was a publicly funded research study, and those conclusions were brought to the public's attention through the, uh, the institute, and for a couple of days he was a hero. And then all of a sudden, he was fired. He lost his job. Uh, he was fired. His wife actually was a part of the team. She was a very well-respected scientist as well, was fired. All the research data was seized, confiscated, uh, and he even had a gag order placed on him. Isn't that interesting? When you look, I'll show you very shortly what was the information that he was coming up with that uh, the Institute felt was important that this was brought to the attention of the public. Um, but it's very interesting when I see what happened. There was two calls that had come through from Monsanto to the director of the Institute, and he was fired. Very interesting. They do not want you to know what is taking place with this technology. They do not want you to be concerned about it. They don't even want you to think about it, which is why there has been such a uh, strong resistance to labeling genetically engineered products and foods in this country. But he, uh, he was dismissed by the Rowett uh, Research Institute. Uh, as it says here, his research team disbanded, its laboratory work destroyed because of the controversial nature of their findings. Uh, he had his supporters. Around the world, scientists raised objection to what had taken place. He was a very well-respected scientist. I believe he had something like over 350 peer-reviewed articles that had been published. That is uh, really significant. I mean, he is a very well-respected scientist. and. Um, he did actually, they did uh, award him the Whistleblower Award uh, from the German Federation of Scientists that was in 2005. His uh, gag order was released when there was hearings that had taken place and I believe Tony Blair had to remove that uh, gag order from him uh, so that he could testify at these hearings. But it's very interesting when you see what took place when a scientist felt that it was important for the public to be aware of what was taking place. Biotech industry does not want you to know. So let's take a look at what he found. First thing that he found was that there are significant chemical and compositional differences between conventional and genetically engineered foods. There are significant differences. A genetically engineered, uh, let's, let's say the soy, is not the same as a conventionally engineered soy. Or genetically engineered potato is not the same as a conventional po potato. They're different, okay? He also found that there are significant nutritional variations or protein levels in different batches of the same genetically engineered food. So for instance, if they're genetically engineering potatoes, one type of potato, between batches, there's significant nutritional variations. And he felt that this is because of the unpredictability of that gene splicing process itself. It's very unpredictable. But the one that really concerned me was this next one. There can be damage to the vital organs. What's a vital organ? What's, what's an example of a vital organ in your body? Heart, you can't live without one. Liver, you can't live without one. Okay, these are vital organs. So damage took place to the vital organs and the immune systems. Okay, is your immune system important for keeping you well? Okay, we can't live without that either, right? 
So damage to the vital organs and immune systems of lab animals which were fed genetically engineered foods, in this case it was potatoes. He found that it damaged vital organs and immune systems in these animals. Guess how long it took for that damage to take place? Any ideas? 10 days. 10 days. We're not talking months. We're not talking years. We're talking 10 days. A very short time for that damage to take place in these animals. That to me was very concerning when I read that. He also found that there is evidence that that cauliflower mosaic virus, that gene that's gene spliced in to turn that package on, okay, it's spliced into almost gen all genetically engineered foods, may be harmful to lab animals and therefore to humans. And this is what he lost his job for, is because he found this and felt that the public needed to know. Isn't that something? That will show you that the biotech industry does not have your health or best interest in mind at all. Now there's four main methods of gene transformation. You will notice with all of these methods that they are all invasive. And that tells me right away that this is not a technology that God approves of. Because God's ways are not forceful and invasive. That is not the way our God operates. But take a look at these uh, methods that they use of gene transformation. We talked about the gene, gene gun. Okay, that was an actual picture of the gene gun that we showed you where they point it and then they fire it and it goes into the, uh, the cells. There's also something called whiskers. It's very similar. Um, basically what that's doing is they're using microfibers that are known as whiskers. These microfibers look like tiny needles with sharp ends and the whiskers are coated with hundreds of copies of the genes just like the gold particles in the gene gun. And then the tissue culture, culture cells and whiskers are then suspended in a tube of solution and shaken vigorously. The tiny fibers stab the plant cells, potentially delivering the DNA into the nucleus of the cell without killing it. So it's the same kind of, you know, very forceful type of uh, technology to get that in there. Electroporation, very similar again. In this procedure, the cells are subjected to a brief electrical pulse, which causes a localized transient disorganization and breakdown of the cell membrane. And then that, of course, makes it permeable to the diffusion of the DNA molecules. And then uh, what they're hoping is the vector DNA is going to be picked up by the cells. So it's a very forceful, again, very forceful technology. This last one here, agrobacterium, uh, this is a plasmid that is widely used to introduce the DNA into the plant cells. Um, it's in fact one of the most commonly used methods for transporting new genes into plant cells and ensuring their stable integration into the genome and now used for many types of crops. This one is of great concern because it's causing some real uh, red flags to come up with certain health conditions and I'm just going to show you as we talk about the dangers now in genetically modified foods, what uh, this is actually causing. So preliminary findings are suggesting a link between Morgellons disease and agrobacterium. That's the one we just talked about that's used in almost all GM foods. It's a soil bacterium extensively manipula manipulated and used in making GM crops. And then they ask the question, has genetic engineering created a new epidemic? Morgellons disease. Anyone hear of Morgellons? Nobody's heard of it. I'll show you what Morgellons is all about. So the CDC, Centers for Disease Control in the United States, announced the launch of an investigation on Morgellons disease in January 2008. So we're not that far past when this happened. After receiving thousands of complaints from people with this bewildering condition, which it describes as follows. Persons who suffer from this unexplained skin condition report a range of cutaneous, that's skin symptoms, including crawling, biting, and stinging sensations, granules, threads, fibers, or black speck-like materials on or beneath the skin, and or skin lesions, example, rashes or sores. This is actual picture here of someone's hand who has Morgellons. In addition to skin manifestations, some sufferers also report fatigue, mental confusion, short-term memory loss, joint pain, and changes in vision. So these symptoms of crawling, biting, and stinging, those sensations, 
that's actually under the skin, but it feels like it's on the skin. Oftentimes, people with this disease will attempt to shower over and over and over and over, uh, trying to get off this stringing, stinging, crawling, biting sensation, but it's not on the skin, it's under the skin. And they will have these fibers that extrude from the skin. This is nothing that is a man-made fiber. It's been analyzed. You'll see here very shortly. It's been analyzed. It's not a man-made fiber. And they are now suspecting that there is a direct connection between this disease and agrobacterium. And this disease is actually something that is starting to um, become more and more common. In fact, we recently had a call from uh, a woman in Nova Scotia who has this disease and was wanting to know how could she be helped. And, you know, this is so new that e even ourselves, you know, we're, we're trying to find ways in order to help people with this disease. So these are the symptoms that they're getting, crawling, biting, stinging, short-term memory loss, things like that. I want to show you here uh, the agrobacterium connection. This is uh, Vitaly Satovsky. He's a professor of molecular and cell biology at SBU in New York. He is the world authority on genetic modification of cells by agrobacterium. I want you to think about it. He is the world authority on these uh, uh, cells that have been modified with agrobacterium. And he t his team, they took uh, scanning electron microscope pictures of the fibers in or extruding from the skin of patients suffering from Morgellons disease, confirming that they're unlike any ordinary natural or synthetic fibers. And he also found that all of the Morgellons patients that have been screened to date have tested positive for the presence of agrobacterium, whereas this microorganism has not been detected in any of the samples derived from the control healthy individuals. So this is what his team is feeling. Their primary conclusion is that agrobacterium may be involved in the etiology and or progression of Morgellons disease. They're believing that has a connection. So what is taking place here? What are we doing? What is science? You know, science has gone past some borders, I believe, and we don't know where this is going to go in the future. But this could be one of the things that we see taking place. They believe there is a very strong link here. Okay, this will work. Let's look at some other dangers. Unpredictable permanent changes in the nature of our food. So genes from bacteria, viruses, and insects which have never been a part of the human diet are being spliced into our food. These have never been part of our diet, but they're now being gene spliced into our food. Deletion of important food elements. Genetic engineers may intentionally remove or inactivate a substance they consider undesirable in a food. This substance may have an unknown but essential quality such as natural cancer inhibiting abilities. They may, they may deactivate something, but again, because they don't know all of the ways that this particular gene is acting and reacting within the organism, they don't know what that could potentially be doing, what the, the potential health outcomes might be. Unanticipated negative ecological impact. A genetically engineered bacterium which was developed to aid in the production of ethanol produced residues which rendered the land infertile. New corn crops planted on this soil grew three inches tall and fell over dead. So it actually affected the soil. Somehow it's, it's affecting that as well. Newer and higher levels of toxins. Many plants naturally produce a variety of compounds that are toxic to humans or alter food quality. Generally, these are present at levels which do not cause problems. Combining plant and animal species and genetic engineering may create new and much higher levels of these toxins. Corn and potatoes, engineered to produce toxins that kill insects, are now classified by the EPA as pesticides rather than vegetables. Can you imagine? So you sit down to what you thought was a nice heaping helping of mashed potato, but it's actually not classified as that. Instead, what you're sitting down to by classification is a nice heaping helping of mashed pesticide. Isn't that terrible? corn and potatoes. 
Allergic reactions. Genetic engineering may transfer new and unidentified proteins from one food into another, triggering allergic reactions. Millions of people who are sensitive to allergens will have no way of identifying or protecting themselves from offending foods. And they believe that this is uh, part of the reason why we see such an increase in allergies taking place, part of it being from this. Now, I just want to uh, see if we can back up here. Horizontal gene transfer. I talked about the fact where biotech says that the uh, package that they have put in, this genetically engineered package, will not survive transit through the digestive tract. But I want to show you what's called horizontal gene transfer. In 2002, a study was conducted which was dubbed the world's first known trial of GM foods on human volunteers. I don't know where they found them. It wouldn't have been me. I would not have volunteered for that job. But researchers demonstrated that a relatively large proportion of genetically modified DNA survived the passage through the human digestive system. Genetically modified soy that was present in the burger and milkshake fed to subjects at the beginning of the experiment transferred its herbicide-resistant gene to the bacteria inside their digestive systems. The transfer occurred after only a single meal. This means that the antibiotic-resistant marker gene could potentially result in new and dangerous antibiotic-resistant diseases. Isn't that something? It happened after one meal. It transferred to gut bacteria. And again, we have had so many people ask us, you know, I've been consuming all of these different things, and what should I do? Because what if this is taking place in my system? I really believe that one of the best things you can do is to do some body cleansing. Because when you do some real intensive cleansing, you flush the good, the bad, and the ugly. They all go. And that is the only way that we know of that you can hope to flush out some of these bacteria that may have possibly been contaminated with genetically engineered uh, uh, DNA, which was, had survived through the digestive tract. So yeah, it does transfer. There is horizontal gene transfer taking place. RBGH and IGF-1. RBGH is recombinant bovine growth hormone. That is a genetically modified growth hormone that is inserted into cattle, into cows, dairy cows. And uh, IGF-1 is insulin-like growth factor. And we'll take a look here if my clicker will cooperate. When cows are injected with recombinant bovine growth hormone, it results in the increase of IGF-1, uh, insulin-like growth factor. And humans also have IGF-1, which is chemically identical to that found in cows. So what they're saying is the cattle uh, that get this recombinant bovine growth hormone have an increase in IGF-1. And IGF-1 is chemically identical to the IGF-1 that we as human beings have as well. Okay, so you'll see the significance of this. IGF-1 is not destroyed by pasteurization. It remains intact in the milk we drink. So if we are drinking cow's milk, we will be getting this increased amount of IGF-1 into our bodies. So what does that do in terms of our health? Elevated levels of this hormone are directly related to cancer in humans. White males are four times more likely to get prostate cancer, and females are seven times more likely to develop breast cancer. So if you're consuming dairy milk, you are going to be raising your risk of cancer from this particular aspect right here. There's an increased risk of lung cancer and colon cancer in both. So we're increasing our risks of cancer by consuming milk, uh, dairy milk. Now farming, this is another danger. One of the aims of transgenic animal research has been the production of additional protein in the milk of mammals, particularly proteins that can be used as pharmaceutical drugs. Goats, cows, and sheep have been modified as highly efficient living pharmaceutical factories continuously producing drugs in their milk within a new industry called farming. Some of the products of farming may be sold as nutraceuticals, part food and part drug. So what they're trying to do is get these animals to actually produce these drugs they're genetically engineered to produce these drugs in the milk. 
So then they just sell the milk and these drugs are actually in the milk. To me, that is very disturbing. Um, I don't drink animal milk, but it's very disturbing to me to think of people who are consuming animal milk that can be uh, affected with these drugs and may have no idea that they are taking them into their body. That is very disturbing because it's the control, the choice that you should have as to what is going in your body has been removed through this kind of technology. And you no longer have the choice because what you think you may be putting in may be completely different from what's going in. Other modified hormones, Monsanto may soon seek marketing approval for recombinant porcine somatotrophin, that's for injection into pigs to produce leaner pork. In fact, Monsanto is working on everything from A to Z. You know, they really are. They are working on everything because obviously each and everything that they can modify and place a patent on, they then control that particular uh, food or animal or whatever it may be. And in time, what they have shown actually is that the genetically modified fish or whatever it may be in, the na in nature, they are much more aggressive. And they will overtake uh, the traditional, for instance, salmon or whatever it may be, they actually overtake those populations and they will wipe them out. So you would not have the originals anymore. You would only have the genetically modified. And I believe really that what they're seeking to do is control the food. And when they can control the food, you know, you basically control the world if you're controlling the food supply. But they have great and grand aims to control. Dr. Herbert Lay, he's the former FDA commissioner. I want you to think about that. Former FDA commissioner had this to say. The thing that bugs me is that people think the FDA is protecting them. It isn't. What the FDA is doing and what the public thinks it is doing are as different as night and day. And that is the truth. We actually have a film that's put out by the Film Board of Canada, no less. It shows the revolving door that takes place between Monsanto and the government. So Monsanto wants a policy in place and a key person will go and take that particular job in the government which is necessary for that policy to be passed. They pass the policy, they go back to work at Monsanto, another policy, another person. It's a revolving door. People between biotech and the government in order to, to uh, bring these um, technologies into place. So the FDA is not protecting us. Now, there are things that we can do. We do not have to sit by and just allow these things to take place feeling hopeless and helpless. There are things that we can do and I believe there are things that we should do. First of all, buy organic foods as much as possible. When you buy organic, you support the organic farmer. When you spend a dollar at the supermarket, the grocery store, at the farmer's market, wherever you spend your dollars, you're actually voting. You're placing your vote. So if you want to place your vote for organic, then buy organic. And you will find that as organic moves in your stores that you shop at, that more and more the, the manager of those stores will be sure to start bringing more and more of the organic in because their goal is to sell. And they don't care really if it's organic or non-organic. What they want to do is sell and they're going to bring whatever is going to be purchased because they don't want to be left at the end of the day with a whole bunch of things that they have to throw away. So you can vote with your dollars that you spend on groceries. You vote every time you buy groceries. So as much as possible, and I say as much as possible because obviously everyone's budget is different and maybe the area in which you're living, you don't have ready access to organic. Uh, but if you do and you can, then support the organic farmers. Ask your retailer to stock organic and non-GMO foods. Um, that can be a very interesting uh, experiment right there because when you talk to your retailer, about stocking non-GMO foods, they will probably give you a blank look. They will have no idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Because here in North America, we've sort of stuck our heads in the sand and thought, well, the government will take care of us and never allow any technology to come in which would be harmful to us in any way. And so we've sort of ignored the whole thing about genetic engineering. I've actually tried this in the grocery store. I've gone in and I've talked to uh, the person that was stocking the uh, groceries and I've asked them, you know, is 
are these tomatoes here, are these genetically engineered or are these uh, non-GMO? And they'll look at it and say, well, you know, they, they look all different, so they, they are not genetically engineered. And I'll say, well, with genetic engineering, you can't see, smell, taste, or feel the difference. Oh, okay. He picked up the box and he looked all over. He said, well, it doesn't say anything on the box, so they must not be genetically engineered. And I said, well, actually, here in North America, we are not required to label genetically engineered foods. In Europe, they actually have to put that on. So you'll look at a can of something with, say, soy in there, or potato, or, or corn, and they'll have to put whether it's genetically engineered or non-GMO. Now, why do they get to have labeling that, that allows them the choice, and we don't have that choice? Why is that? It's because we've not said anything. Over there, they've been very vocal in their protest. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we should maybe be quite as vocal, you know, chaining ourselves to supermarket carts. And, and uh, we actually have a video where they are out, uh, it's in, in Britain, I believe it is, and they're out, uh, a whole group of them, pulling up these transgenic plants. The police are sort of standing there watching. There's really not a lot they can do. A little lady in her very English flower dress with her little flowered hat and everything and she's right out there with them yanking these out of the ground again I'm not saying that we should maybe be that uh, you know um, extreme in how we protest but I believe there are things that we can do and there are things that we definitely should do we don't have to allow this technology to happen without raising our voices you can write to your MP that is something that we can do we can write to our MP. We can write to the government, letting them know that we want labeling on all GMO products. Those are things we can do. In fact, uh, years ago, uh, when we actually still lived out west, and they were attempting to bring genetically engineered wheat into Canada. And at those times, every time I did the classes on this, and I would hand out the little um, petitions that people could just fill out their name and address petitions to just mail into the government to stop this technology from coming into Canada. And of course, it was done all across Canada. Many people got involved in handing these out, filling them out, sending them in, and guess what? We don't have GMO wheat in Canada. Isn't that great? Because people raised their voices and said, no, stop it. So when you see these things come around, you may get opportunities to, in fact, I'll give you some websites at, at the end of this presentation, which I would suggest uh, jotting them down, um, connecting with them. When these petitions come around, a lot of times via email, sign them, send them in, because there is constantly uh, bills coming and, and people are trying to pass things through government, trying to get technologies and things in. And this is affecting the health of all of us. It's affecting the choice of all of us. It's taking away our choice to know what we are putting in our bodies. Get the word out to as many people as possible. Share the information. Because so many people do not know about genetic engineering, share what you do know with them. Continue educating yourself and share that with them. Never stop educating yourself about the foods that you eat. And I might mention too, um, I don't have time to really do it uh, here, but oftentimes what I do with my classes is I talk to them about food labels. Read your food labels. Just because you bought something for the last, you know, year and everything was good, all the ingredients were good, you know, manufacturers have a way of changing the ingredients from time to time. And I always read those ingredients on a regular basis to make sure that that product is still safe, that I still am comfortable to consume that product. So continue educating yourself, continue reading those labels. Now here's a list of genetically modified foods. Uh, rice, it's not all rice. Th there is a rice that has been genetically modified, it's called golden rice. And they've basically modified that to up the amount of vitamin A in there. Okay, so that's not all rice, I just want to make that clear. Soybeans, most of the soybeans are genetically engineered. So if you drink soy milk, use soy sauce, tofu, uh, soy lecithin, soy flour, any of the derivatives. You have to start to think of derivatives of these plants, okay? You need to make sure that it's organic. So if you're going to use tofu, organic tofu. If you're using tamari or soy sauce, it's organic tamari. You know, if you're using a soy beverage of some kind of soy milk or something, make sure it's organic soy that is in there. 
Uh, tomatoes. I am not 100% sure whether the tomatoes are or not G GMO, but I take my stand on the side of safety and I buy organic tomatoes. Um, some websites, some uh, resources will say there are no genetically engineered tomatoes on the market. Other ones will say that there are. So I really don't know. I've seen both sides of that. So on safety side, I just buy my tomato and tomato derivatives as organic. So again, if you want to make that choice, then it would be all your foods con containing tomato products, your tomato sauce, tomato paste, salsa, ketchup, so on and so forth, right? Corn. Corn is a highly genetically modified crop. That is something that you want to buy organic, organic corn. And uh, it's challenging to find organic fresh corn. Um, I know for ourselves, we can pretty much only get the organic frozen corn, but I don't compromise. Sweet corn, genetically modified. Canola is genetically modified. Potatoes, genetically modified. You want to buy them organic, organic potatoes. Or heirloom, if it says heirloom, those are original, so you can buy the heirloom. Papaya, uh, papayas about 50% uh, 50, 50 from Hawaii have been modified. Again, you have no idea when you look, uh, for instance, we were in a market uh, just today and we saw papayas from Hawaii. Well, you can't tell if those are modified or non-modified. I know that about 50% of the crop or more from Hawaii of those crops are modified. So I don't eat papayas from Hawaii, okay? Buy your papayas from some other place. Cottonseed oil, I mentioned, uh, I believe it was last night, that cottonseed oil is part of vegetable oil. So if you buy oils that just say vegetable oil, cottonseed oil is often one of the oils that's in there. So again, make sure that the oil that you're buying, uh, if it's just a vegetable oil, is organic. Um, tobacco, vegetable oil, uh, we just mentioned sugar beets. Uh, sugar beets just actually came on the market last year. The GMO sugar beets came out on the market last year. Uh, dairy products um, and some vitamins actually have even been genetically modified. Uh, some of the vitamins such as vitamin A, B2, B6, B12, they can be derived from GMO sources. So that gives you an idea of some of the things that you need to be aware of and start looking for those uh, in an organic form. Now I want to put a list up here for you. Uh, this first website, seedsofdeception.com, seedsofdeception.com. I highly recommend you to, to get on that website and sign up for Jeffrey Smith's newsletter. Jeffrey Smith is probably the leader out there and has been for years and years in working against genetic engineering technology. He's written books, DVDs, he travels extensively, he speaks extensively, trying to stop the technology, trying to educate people to make them aware. And he has a, a free newsletter you can sign up uh, for, and he will keep you up to date on the latest information that is taking place. So things that are happening right in, uh, as we may be speaking even, the most current information on genetic engineering, he'll keep you up to date on. Another good website is thecampaign.org. Uh, Jeffrey Smith's book, Seeds of Deception. I highly recommend that book. It is excellent. It will tell you a little bit about the story at the beginning of Dr. Pusti, and you will see what actually took place with that. Excellent, excellent book. Uh, a couple other good books, Genetically Engineered Food, A Self-Defense Guide for Consumers, and Eat Your Genes, How Genetically Modified Food is Entering Our Diet. So there's some other good books. There's other great books out there now as well on genetic engineering. Um, and I would say pick the books up, read them, educate yourself, know what's taking place, because it's only as we are educated and know what is happening that we can take steps then proactively to help prevent this technology from carrying on or to protect ourselves even from uh, as much as we can from uh, being exposed to it. So I hope this information has been helpful for you. I hope it's going to help you. Again, don't be discouraged. Don't be overwhelmed thinking, oh, what am I going to eat? You don't have to stop eating potatoes and tomatoes and corn and soy. Just choose organic 
instead of genetically modified, to choose them organic instead of conventional, be on the side of safety. Thank you.